All right. Um, so the first thing is, Nino is amaz an amazing guy because he seems to have endless energy. Maybe it's because he doesn't need to sleep, as he was just saying. But um, the other thing is that although he has worked with vertebrates for what is it now, 25 years or something like that, I think he remains an invertebrate at heart. Um, and that shows in nearly every paper he publishes where he acknowledges or cites papers from, from this community, this group very often and, and, and work that has been done before and, and um, tries to apply these things to, to what he does right now. Uh, and has done for the past, I don't know, 20 years or more. <clears throat> so Nino uh, did all his undergrad and graduate work in, in studies in, in Germany at the University of Regensburg, and then moved to, to Canada to work with Kier Pearson as a postdoc, where he spent, I think it was five years, but uh, from my count was 13 papers you got out of that time. Um, on mostly locomotion in locust and some also in cat. And then he went, uh, and, and there he, um, I think, I don't know if you met, but at that time, Kier was getting a whole bunch of German gradu graduates to work in his lab and Ansgar was one of them who was here. And Ansgar went back to Germany before, went to Kaiserslautern and Nino followed. So, and in Kaiserslautern is where I met Nino for the first time. Um, when I did a little summer thing, working with um, Jochen Deitmar on, on pH regulation by GLIA and the SDG. And, um, and we had some nice, nice times there um, in, in, in Germany. And then, um, and there he worked with Ansgar in Locust, I think also some papers came out of that time, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm correct. And then he moved to Göttingen and uh, as an assistant professor still and spent four years there. And what I, looking at the papers that came out and what he told me before is that all the work was basically done by himself as an assistant professor, teaching, writing grants and the whole thing, um, hands on on the rig. Am I right, Nino? Ever the times, oh my God, I miss them. <clears throat> yes, I miss right. those times. And then he was snatched by University of Chicago and um, uh, promised his wife to be there for three years, <laughs> spent more than a decade and then moved to Seattle um, as director of, oh, oh, I don't know if that's there. No, you moved to Seattle before or as director of the Seattle uh, Children's Research Institute? Yeah, that's yeah, how that's, they recruited me. <laughs> that's how they recruited you. But in Chicago, we met again because I went for a job interview in his department unfortunately didn't get it. Um, and I remember those, those years as Nino coming by car with his whole family, which is not a small one. And some of the kids are here, so they, they may remember some of this to Woods Hall, to their net meeting where we met many years um, um, with him and the whole family and all the, the fun stuff we had there. And uh, just to cut the very long and productive story short, see, Nino is now in Seattle at uh, the University of Washington and is the director of this institute, is also an associate director of another institute, the, what is it called? Center for Health Development and Disability, co-director of the Neurodevelopment Research, Con Research Consortium. So I don't know how you have energy to do all this. Um, then he's, editor of many things and recently became the chief uh, editor of Journal of Neurophysiology on top of all that. And um, well, it's, I, I think it's a, a great career and uh, I'm very much looking forward to the story you're going to tell us um, right now. So welcome and thanks for, for doing this, for giving us this talk. Corica, thank you so much. I started to share already because, uh, one second, uh, how does it work? Uh, stop video. Do you see that the, the slides? Yeah. Okay. And you see it as a slideshow? Uh, it seems to be. Okay, one second. Now it's, uh, yeah. Perfect. Hey, uh, Jorge, thank you so much for the introduction. And, and also thank you everybody for being here. 
it really is a family affair, kind of like it's all my friends that we grew up together. And uh, I am actually a little sad because it's all virtual. And so, you know, like big hug to everybody and thank you so much for listening here. And um, as Jorge said, uh, really, I still stay an invertebrate person. It's like your first love. And I'm, I'm still married to my first love, Erica. So, so kind of like uh, that kind of guy, obviously. So anyway, so I wanted to talk about the complicated life of CPGs. And, and I think everybody here appreciates that CPGs are complicated, but we often forget why they're so complicated because they have to solve a lot of uh, huge problems. For example, the locusts have to fly across the Red Sea in a regular fashion. That's like 300 kilometers. And the Red Sea is actually famous for sunstorms coming from all sorts of directions. So all the CBG has to kind of carry this uh, animal all over this uh, distance and has to keep the animal safe. Now, compared to this, you know, breathing seems like a piece of cake. It's just like inhalation, exhalation. But when you think about it, actually breathing is also pretty complicated. And that CPG has to also handle a lot of complicated stuff. And it has to, for example, be coordinated with exercise. If you don't do it, you quickly run out of air. You have to coordinate uh, your, your breathing with vocalization. In fact, vocalization is a breathing behavior that is highly cognitively driven. You sing, which is a breathing behavior. Then you express your emotions also in a sigh of relief. And then in fact, also, you know, crying and, and laughing are all uh, breathing behaviors that are driven by emotions. And then you have to coordinate also breathing with uh, uh, other behaviors like swallowing, if you don't swallow properly, you activate coughing, which is also a reconfigured breathing CPG that is involved. And we're just beginning to understand this. And uh, then finally, of course, we all wear masks right now because of COVID, which affects uh, breathing and actually uh, is the big problem here. And then breathing also controls your cortical state. You know, So we all know that uh, people do yoga to focus and to concentrate. And in fact, you know, <clears throat> There's nice work done by Andreas Dargun in Berlin, who shows that uh, activity in the prefrontal cortex is driven in phase with inspiration. So when you say I'm inspired, your prefrontal cortex is indeed inspired and rhythmically active. <clears throat> now, at night, 95% of the time when you wake up, you wake up actually with a sigh. So, you know, you sleep like this and then you do this, you wake up, arouse, and this is due to the coupling of breathing with, uh, with noradrenergic neurons that change your cortical state. And then of course, as I said already, the cortex also influences how you breathe. So when I talk, I co coordinate breathing very, very uh, precisely. And all this <clears throat> is coordinated with one central pattern generator, which sits in the medulla and it's called the Prebertzinger complex. And, um, but before I wanna talk about this, area, I want to remind everybody that actually CPGs not only control rhythmic motor behaviors, but they control everything you do in your brain. So basically you have rhythms everywhere in the cortex, in the hippocampus, amygdala, striatum, etc. In fact, there are many, many different rhythms. So when you listen to my talk, your brain is in a 30 hertz rhythm. When you get bored, hopefully not, then you go in a 10 hertz rhythm. If you go into a coma, you get all sorts of different states of rhythmicity. So it's all rhythmic in your brain. And these rhythms are highly interactive. Thalamus, cortex are rhythmically active together. And it's all in a behavioral context. For example, if you uh, have feared learning, the amygdala and the hippocampus are rhythmically active. And what's important here is that each of these brain areas consists of their own central pattern generator. So the thalamus is a central pattern generator, cortex, et cetera. And you can isolate these areas, these CPGs, and they continue to be independently rhythmically active, very much like what you do in the stomatogastric ganglion or what we did in the locus. Uh, you can isolate these networks in, in vitro. <clears throat> and what you get is uh, very much like in the stomatogastric ganglion, you still have rhythmic activity in the dish. This is a sleep rhythm of a cortical slice. And uh, in the whole animal, 
you see exactly the same rhythm. And here the cortical rhythm is now coordinated with the hippocampus. And the idea is that during sleep, you know, you all the memories that you acquire during the day are then consolidated with the cortex through these upstates that are synchronized. And if rhythmicity is disturbed, for example, here in a model of Alzheimer, then you can see that now the cortex is not synchronized anymore with the hippocampus and you cannot form a memory. Another example of a disturbed rhythmogenesis is of course epilepsy, where you get too synchronized uh, rhythmic activity. And again, you can take out this cortical activity from, from a neocortex, in this case, in, from a human. You can intracellular record for this and you can relate this intracellular activity with, um, with the actual patient. And in this case, actually we're able to use the slice to find a drug and actually save the life of this kid. So basically the ability to isolate CPGs opens up endless uh, opportunities, uh, not only therapeutics, but also opportunities to dissect the underlying mechanism, which of course all of you know, uh, and the invertebrates continue to be the, the champions here that you have identified neurons. You can ask the question, how are these neurons uh, connected with each other? You can study this in vitro, but you can study this also in a whole animal to basically test the functional relevance of the CPG in a behaving animal. <clears throat> Now, based on this, uh, oh yeah, by the way, that's what, what I looked like in, when I did this kind of experiments. And that's Nicolo, who is actually in the audience uh, 30 years later. And uh, anyway, so based on this work, kind of you can crystallize really from an eagle eyes view, uh, three general properties that are critical for rhythmogenesis. So you have on one hand, uh, synaptic inhibition. So this is a beautiful work by Mel and Kier, where uh, they basically established the circuitry in the locus. And you can see all these are depressor neurons, like 501, and they inhibit the elevator neurons. And then you have the elevator neurons that inhibit the depressor neurons. So you establish a reciprocal inhibitory network uh, that then establishes the different phases of uh, flight. Now, you have also excitation in this network. Excitation synchronizes these neurons that are rhythmic in phase with the elevators or rhythmic in phase with the depressor. And, uh, and then, however, when you dig deeper, it gets easily more complicated. And you, of course, know this in the stomatogastic ganglion. But here, uh, work by Mel uh, with Kier, where he showed that um, the 301, which is an inhibitory neurons, is active at the same time like 501. And this is not in this network, probably because it's a little bit more complicated here, but you have also concurrent excitation inhibition. <clears throat> now, another very important property is, uh, of course, bursting, intrinsic bursting. And this is work that we did back then uh, together with ANSCA, where we showed that actually octopamine release during flight can induce this bursting. And it actually amplifies synaptic input from afferences, the tegular input, uh, that then triggers an, an wing elevation. And, um, and you can test this actually in a flying animal. Now, all these properties that were established in invertebrates, you find again and again, also in the mammalian central pattern generators, including of course the generator for breathing. And in order to show you this, I wanna first explain you what breathing is all about. So you have like three phases, which is, kind of similar to the, to the somatogastric ganglion. You have on one hand inspiration, which is driven by the activation of the diaphragm, which causes the inhalation of the air into the lung. And then comes a phase called post-inspiration, which is actually driven by the mechanical recoil forces of uh, the lung. So air kind of gets out passively because of these air, uh, of these recoil forces. And what you wanna do is to slow down this exhalation. So you actually, during post inspiration, also activate laryngeal muscles, you activate the diaphragm, and, uh, and that slows down exhalation and, um, and also increases the gas exchange. So when I talk to you right now, I am actually talking in post inspiration. So I, I take a breath and then I talk and vocalize during this phase until I ran out of air and then I take another inspiration. Now, 
if I am stressed or if you're jogging or something, then you get another phase, which is active expiration, where you start to activate your intercostal muscles and you're pushing air out actively. And, uh, but this is actually only happening under high metabolic demand. And normally you're breathing basically in, in inspiration and post-inspiration. And as I said, uh, this post-inspiratory activity is important for vocalization, but it's also important for other behaviors, like for example, swallowing. You don't wanna swallow during an inspiration because then you get your fluids into your lungs. So you swallow actually uh, here during this phase. So when you look at the motor output of these uh, animals, and this is now a, a breathing animal, you can see that the motor output is highly variable. And also here you have a, a neural recording from uh, the vagus nerve, which invades the, the laryngeal muscles during post-inspiration. And you can see here in this uh, uh, animal, it's, it's highly variable. And uh, when you wait for a while, then you can see in, in this state, now the post-inspiration is actually much larger than the inspiratory component. Uh, whereas here, the inspiratory component was larger. So there's a dynamic variability here uh, in these animals. And in many cases, in fact, you can start with an animal where you don't have any uh, laryngeal activation. Uh, so no obvious post-inspiration, and then it comes later on. So it's, so the inspiratory phase is, uh, the post-inspiratory phase is pretty dynamically assembled. And by the way, also the inspiratory activity can be very variable. And the idea is that these two phases are established actually by two central pattern generators. And uh, in, in 91, so more than 30 years ago, uh, Jeff Smith and, and, and others and Jack Feldman described the so-called Prebertzinger complex which uh, we now know is important for the generation of inspiration. And uh, it's a very small network. So here, uh, this is uh, in a mouse. So it's actually not much different than a thoracic ganglion in a locust. And, um, but you can study it, of course, in a slice preparation. And then uh, we recently discovered another central pattern generator, which is more rostral to this. It's, it, we call it the post uh, complex or PICO. And uh, these neurons here are different than the neurons uh, in the Prebertzinger complex. They are cholinergic, glutamatergic, whereas the neurons that generate the inspiratory rhythm are characterized by a transcription factor, which is called DBX1. Now, you can study these in a transverse slice, but you can actually record from both of those CPGs at the same time uh, by making a so-called horizontal slice where you have here the Probertzinger complex and more rostral, the Pico area. And when you record from them at the same time, you can see this alternating activity between inspiration, post-inspiration, inspiration, post-inspiration post -inspiration generated by these two networks. But, uh, and they are interacting with each other. So if you stimulate, for example, the Probertzinger complex optogenetically by activating these DBX1 neurons, you inhibit the Pico neurons and vice versa, if you activate the PICO neurons optogenetically, then you inhibit the inspiratory activity in the Prebertzinger complex and activate the post-inspiration. And you can do this in a slice. You can do this also in a whole animal. And in a whole animal, you activate this laryngeal activation and you inhibit the ongoing inspiratory rhythm and delay the onset. So this uh, reciprocal, uh, interaction between these two central pattern generators. And, um, and they have also differential uh, modulatory properties. So if you apply three micromolar norepinephrine, which is really not much, you can see that now this PICO area now can outpace the Prebertzinger complex. So per, per each inspiration, you have like several cycles of this post inspiratory activity. And we were kind of surprised, but we, uh, now there's increasing evidence that in fact, the Pico is involved in, in vocalization. And this is from an opera singer. You can see basically how here you have inspiration. And then in, in this time you have uh, activation of the laryngeal muscles. And, and of course, I'm not an opera singer. I, I wouldn't be able to do that, but uh, they, they can. And um, now to show that it's really independent rhythmogenesis networks, you can, make now transverse slices where you can separate them. And then 
from one animal, you can have one pico slice and one pre single slice. Both are rhythmic and both have, as I said, differential neuromodulatory properties. So if you apply, for example, DAMGO, which acts on the mu opiate receptor at 25 nanomole, you totally shut down pico, but you don't affect very much the pre single complex. And you can show this in a dose response curve. So you can see at 25 nanomole, you shut down pico whereas uh, the pre is, is pretty happy still and generating rhythmic activity. Now, using this differential neuromodulation, you can also ask the question, uh, is this area necessary and sufficient? And uh, this is now in a whole animal. So you activate PICO with an optogenetic activation of these, uh, uh, these neurons. You can trigger a post-inspiration and you reset the respiratory rhythm. So the respiratory, the inspiratory rhythm becomes, uh, starts later. And then you inject DAMGO into the same area, shutting down PICO. And you can see you're losing this post inspiratory activity that was here. And uh, now when you sign light on, you get just a, a small activation and you lose uh, basically this reset. So this delay is missing. So this area seems to be important for the generation of post inspiratory activity. But what it also shows is that this area is not essential for breathing because the animal is breathing still, even though you knocked out this post inspiratory activity. Now, Alisa Half, a postdoc that uh, joined my lab, she reproduced this finding. So she stimulated PICO optogenetically, got beautiful post inspiration in the vagus nerve. But Elisa wanted to know more. So she recorded also from other nerves and she recorded, for example, from the submental complex. And the submental complex is an indicator for swallowing. And what she found is that if you activate PICO during inspiration, you actually trigger a swallow. Whereas if you activate PICO during expiration, you trigger only the post inspiratory activity and not a swallow, so no submental complex. And so she did a phase plot and you can see that basically in inspiration, you trigger swallow and uh, in post-inspiration, you trigger, uh, uh, it, no, in expiration, you trigger the post-inspiratory activity. And she continues with this project. It's pretty exciting because uh, we can expose these mice to intermittent hypoxia and, and, and that totally suppresses the possibility to activate swallowing, which is clinically a very interesting uh, problem. And she's also starting to dissect, you know, how these different oscillators uh, now interact with a swallowing oscillator. And, uh, and she works together with Louise. Louise is a, a fantastic neuroanatomist who is doing like the track tracing between these different areas. And Malusa is looking at the effect of the sympathetic drive that is also activated by this area. So uh, there's also an interesting project that uh, Sanya did in my lab, another daughter of mine. And, um, and she found in mice that are just born. So it's really a heroic experiment because these mice are typically born at one o'clock at night or two o'clock at night. And then you can see that the rhythm is totally messed up. So that there are big uh, breath and then there are small ones. And then you can see that later on, it's very clear that you have these two components that are just not fused. And then later on, after one hour, they fuse and form one breath. And uh, what was fascinating is that if you had a premature birth, this coupling of these two oscillators over time took up to two weeks. And, and, and these mice uh, were basically not breathing normal for quite some time. And I had uh, the pleasure to go to Texas Children's and, and see uh, uh, from a baby that was just born just freshly. And you can see also breathing totally messed up. And, uh, and it would be really interesting uh, to now study how this, uh, these two centers or these CPGs coordinate breathing uh, early on during development. Now, now, now talk uh, about the pre complex. And I told you uh, we know way more about this Pretzinger complex because uh, it was discovered already 30 years ago. What you can do, and I will show you a lot of those traces, you can stick a big electrode into the pre complex, record population activity and integrate this. So then you have this integrated population activity while you can also record intracellular from these neurons. And so we know that these are inspiratory neurons. And, um, 
And we know also that these neurons that are driving this inspiratory rhythm are DBX1 neurons. So they're uh, marked by a transcription factor. You can label them with GFP. You can also optogenetically label them and you can, can show, okay, these neurons are indeed active in phase with inspiration. And then you can optogenetically activate them. And each time you activate them, you trigger the inspiration. And then uh, you can use another transgenic mouse where now instead of having channel rhodopsin, you have archaeopsin, rhodopsin in there, which is an inhibitory protein. And, uh, and you can shut down this network. So you can show these neurons are sufficient, but also necessary for the generation of this rhythm. Now, traditionally, when you ask the question, you know, what are these glutamatergic neurons doing to the network? What we have done in the past is specifically in mammalian nervous systems, we just injected glutamate into this area that we're interested in. And then uh, in this case, uh, if you do this in the pre complex, you find that indeed these glutamatergic neurons, which are excitatory in the, in the mammalian nervous system, are speeding up the respiratory frequency. The problem with this experiment is that if you inject glutamate, you will activate not only the DBX1 neurons, you will also activate inhibitory neurons. You activate also some non-DBX1 neurons. And so really it's not clear why there is a frequency increase. And so when Nathan Berch uh, joined my lab as a postdoc, he's now a system professor. But when he joined me, we wanted to know, you know, what's happening if we stimulate specifically the DBX1 neurons. And our expectation was that in fact, we get a much larger frequency increase because now we're not activating the inhibitor neurons. But to his surprise and to my surprise, of course, uh, the stimulation of these DBX1 neurons did really barely nothing to this frequency. So there was an amplitude effect, but no frequency effect or minimal frequency effect. So that was pretty shocking to us, but uh, it got even more shocking because when Nathan then uh, stimulated specifically the inspiratory neurons, these DBX1 neurons during inspiration when they're active, these glutamatergic neurons actually slowed down the rhythm. And when you stimulated these uh, during expiration when they're not active, it actually sped up the rhythm. So that was a little puzzling, but the reason for this is that these DBX1 neurons have a dramatic refractive period. And, uh, and this can be shown here in this experiment. So here is your population burst. And when you stimulate these DBX1 neurons right after an inspiratory burst, the stimulation does nothing. And it takes actually several seconds, like six to seven seconds before you're able to generate the next and trigger the next inspiratory burst. So there's a huge refractive period. And that, of course, is another puzzle because, oh, voila, uh, because these animals uh, breathe at a frequency. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I got too excited here, obviously. So these animals, they breathe at a frequency of two hertz. So if you have a refractive period of, of six to seven seconds, you know, it's very difficult to explain how these DBX1 neurons can generate a two hertz rhythm. And as I said, it's due to a refractive period. And if you stimulate these DBX1 neurons intracellular in an isolated state, you can see that after the stimulation, these neurons hyperporize quite dramatically and uh, become not excitable for quite some time. And the more you stimulate them, and this is shown in this graph here, the more you stimulate them, the longer it takes until these neurons become excitable again. So there's an intrinsic mechanism that shuts down these neurons and it takes a while. And this mechanism depends on the excitability of these neurons. So the more excited, the longer the refractive period. And I don't go into all the details here, but, but Nathan actually showed this beautifully how it affects the refractive period. And this excitability now is regulated by the inhibitor neurons. So 40% of the neurons in the pre complex are inhibitory, and they're activated also during inspiration. So you have basically during inspiration at the same time, inhibitory neurons active, but also excited to neurons. And if you patch clamp from these inspiratory neurons, you can see that they're bombarded by EPSCs, but they get also bombarded by the IPSCs at the same time. So basically their excitability is Con continuously regulate during each inspiration by this break mechanism of inhibiting neurons. 
And, uh, and that reminds me a little bit to the 301 neurons and it would be fun to go back to the locus and see whether we have similar principle here. But, um, but what happens because of this decreased excitability of the DBX1 neurons, you reduce the refractive period. And in fact, when you stimulate insparchy neurons during inspiration, like down here optogenetically, you're actually speeding up the, the respiratory rhythm. And you can do this in a slice, you can do this in an anesthetized animal, and you can do this in an alert animal, stimulating inhibitory neurons during inspiration, when the inhibitory neurons are also active, you can speed up the rhythm. So that was very contraintuitive. And in fact, uh, you found that the stimulation of inhibitory neurons speeds it up the rhythm by more than 300%. Whereas if you stimulate the DBX1 neuron during the time when they're not active, you only increase the frequency uh, slightly by 20%. Now, the, the take home message is basically that the rhythm generation, the pre Bertzinger complex depends on this close interplay between excitation and the inhibitory rhythmogenic neurons and uh, the DBX1 neurons, they are important for synchronizing this network, but they also increase the refractory time and slow it, whereas the inhibitory neurons decrease the refractory time and accelerate the rhythm. <clears throat> but timing is everything. And I mean, you in the somatogastic world know this, of course. Uh, when you look at the discharge of these inhibitory neurons and the excitatory neurons, during inspiration, you can see in this reset and phase shift curve that in fact, during this time, the inhibitory neurons actually have maximal accelerating uh, potency on the rhythm. The, deep, the delay caused by the DBX1 neuron during this time is not that much. And so they're clearly overcoming this inhibitory effect of the DBX1 neurons. And, um, and these inhibitory neurons are specifically active only during this phase. They are not active before and they're not active afterwards. By contrast, when you look at the DBX1 neurons, you can see these neurons actually start to discharge already before the burst at this time. And at this time, actually they are causing also phase advance. So basically the combination of these neurons are keeping the breathing rhythm faster and, and ensure that rhythm uh, persists. In fact, you can uh, kind of divide now this respiratory rhythm in three distinct phases. So you have the inspiratory phase where the burst happens during which you have a co-activation of inhibitory and excitatory neurons that regulate the excitability of this burst, which is then followed by the refractive period during which these neurons are not active. And then you get uh, this so-called percolation phase where the excitatory neurons start to activate these DBX1 neurons that then ultimately leads, leads to this population burst uh, where you activate also the inhibitory neurons. Now, uh, these inhibitory neurons, they regulate the frequency. They also regulate the shape of the burst because when you look at the shape of these neurons, these inhibitory neurons, they have a decrementing pattern whereas the DBX1 neurons are much more like an augmenting bursting neuron. And, uh, and you can see that basically the inhibition is bombarding these neurons early on in this phase, but then the inhibition gets weaker. And then what happens here is you trigger an intrinsic burst in these neurons. And this is shown in the next slide. Here is a population burst, an uh, uh, intracellular recording of, of one of those DBX1 neurons. You can see this concurrent excitation and inhibition bombarding this neuron early on in this inspiratory phase and then the triggering of this intrinsic burst. And we know it's an intrinsic burst because we can also inject a depolarizing current pulse during expiration, and you can trigger a very similar burst like here in this synaptically driven situation. And you can also do some tricks that we all learned from the locust and the invertebrate system. You can inject short current pulses and you can pre prematurely uh, uh, interrupt this ongoing burst. And what's happening here is, is uh, basically that you have a battle going on between inhibition, excitation, and bursting. And this battle is, it's, is different in every cycle. So sometimes you have a stronger inhibition, the burst comes later. Sometimes you have a weaker inhibition, the burst comes earlier. So that's uh, basically going on uh, at every cycle. It's also not too different from, from the locust flight system where 
you have also these bursting uh, properties that are triggered by the synaptic input, in this case, uh, from the tegula. Now, uh, these bursting properties are diverse. So you have different types of bursting properties. We have some that are dependent on a trip channel. So they're calcium dependent, they're not voltage dependent. And we call them the can bursters. You have also some bursting properties that depend on the persistent sodium current. They are voltage dependent. They have very different properties. So this one is mainly there to uh, amplify synaptic transmission. And that uh, probably we think is more important for the timing regulation. And uh, very much like in the locust again, here the 566, uh, these properties are highly modulated and, um, and there are different neuromodulators different, uh, activating different properties. So for example, uh, alpha-1 adrenergic norepinephrine uh, activates the can bursting, 5-HT2A activates the persistent sodium bursting, and so you can imagine that basically these different neuromodulators converging on this network can change the contribution of these very different bursting properties to this network. And, uh, and so the idea is that basically this respiratory network is bombarded by different neuromodulators that via different second messenger system can facilitate and also inhibit the ongoing rhythm. And this slide here clearly is stolen by by the stomatogastic system here. And what you can see is obviously here, you know way more about the normal neuromodulatory input onto the stomatogastic system. And I think if we would work harder in the respiratory system, we probably would also identify many, many, many more modulators impinging on this network, but well, we need more postdocs here. So, but how do these neuromodulators actually change the frequency? of the respiratory network. And uh, I wanna dive a little bit deeper now into substance P. And substance P is activating a receptor called NK1, neurokinin-1 receptor. The neurokinin-1 receptor is specifically expressed within the pre complex. And actually this NK1 receptor was actually used to define also the location of the pre complex, for example, also in humans. And when you stimulate NK1 receptor with substance P, what happens is very reliably, the frequency of the respiratory rhythm goes up. And the question is now, how does the frequency go up based on what we know about this respiratory rhythm? And um, early on, that was, uh, one second here, that was in, already in 2004, Fernando Pena in my lab, uh, and he's now professor, actually head of department at University of Mexico. He showed that uh, substance P intrinsically uh, activates intrinsic bursting in the persistence burster, but also in the cane burster. And back then we thought, okay, we solved the problem. Substance P induces bursting and therefore the frequency goes up. And, uh, but that turns out to uh, be probably wrong because if you induce bursting in these neurons, you should actually increase the refractive period and actually slow down the respiratory rhythm. But we see that the frequency is increased. So uh, this puzzle then uh, really excited Nathan and Nathan wanted to know why is it that despite this intrinsic bursting, uh, substance P increases the frequency. And again, I come back, it all depends on the timing. And, um, this is work again from Nathan, uh, who showed that if you apply substance P, it activates very specifically these uh, excitatory DBX1 neurons, and it activates them specifically during this pre-inspiratory phase. So when you look at this uh, uh, plot here, you can see this is before and then after, there's an activation of activity in these DBX1 neurons, specifically during this pre-inspiratory phase. And this, remember, is a time when actually DBX1 neurons speed up the rhythm. And the effect on the burst is minimal. And the effect on the burst is minimal because substance P doesn't change the inhibitory neurons. So it doesn't change these inhibitory neurons that continue to regulate the excitability of these neurons during the burst. So in other words, these inhibitory neurons are kind of the guardians of the burst and allow the network to get activated specifically during this pre-inspiratory phase. So coming back to this three-phase rhythm that I showed you, here we have the percolation phase, this pre-inspiratory phase, 
And what you see is what sepsis P is doing. It activates this phase, which then causes a phase advance and causes uh, an increase in the frequency. What's interesting to note here is that uh, you are having still the refractive period. So the refractive period kind of is a guardian of the timing because basically you can dump on a lot of sepsis P, but the frequency only increases until it hits the refractive period. And so it cannot overexcite this network. And I wanna talk about this later on because it can actually under certain circumstances. Now, based on what we now know about the CPG and these three phases, inspiration, the refractive period and the percolation, uh, it can raise the hypothesis whether these three phases can serve as a temporal scaffold for the three breathing phases that I told you at the beginning, you know, this inspiration, the expiration. And, uh, and we know that uh, the pico areas, these pico neurons are firing exactly during this time when the pre single complex is hitting this refractive period. We also know that the pico neurons are inhibited by this burst as we showed here optogenetically. And we also know that when you inhibit the pico neurons, they actually show a rebound that could then activate the pico neurons during this phase here. Moreover, we know that in fact, the, the pico neurons start to delay the onset of the next burst. So there will be an interaction between this percolation phase and this delay caused by the activation of the pico. So you have basically a switch from one phase to the other, which is facilitated by the synaptic interaction. And then you have a process that will uh, ensure that the next burst happens. But of course, uh, to study this, we had to go in vivo. And here is where uh, another very talented postdoc comes in. This is Nick Bush. And Nick Bush really took on a very heroic project. So he, in, uh, in, um, he introduced the so-called neuropixel approach to the lab. So these are probes where you can record from 380 neurons at the same time in a very small like space uh, uh, situation. And he started to inject, insert these probes into the, pre uh, into the respiratory network of in vivo animals, and then combined it also with optotagging to not only record from hundreds of neurons in this network, but also identify their identity using this optotagging. I will not go too much into details in this optotagging here because uh, believe it or not, I don't have enough time. But, uh, but basically uh, Nick was characterizing these neurons in vivo uh, simultaneously from up to 300 neurons. And, uh, and this is the compilation of uh, a total of 20,000 neurons that you recorded in different animals. And <clears throat> he sorted these neurons based on the discharge. So this from here, so every line is one neuron. And uh, in fact, it's an average activity of this neuron. And uh, from here to here are 2000 neurons. So it's, a, it's quite a lot of neurons. And you can see that here you have the inspiratory neurons. And then here you have the expiratory neurons. And so you have a, a bunch of inspiratory neurons and much less expiratory neurons. And, um, and you can plot this in, in this circular uh, diagram here, uh, where you have here the inspiratory neurons. Do you see the majority fire actually around the peak? So this is the number of neurons, the majority are firing there. But then you have also a large population of expiratory neurons that are firing during mid expiration. Now, uh, first finding from him was that in fact, when he goes along this entire column, you have a predominance of inspiratory neurons here, also in the area of the pre complex, but you have also expiratory neurons. And then as you go more rostral and hit the area of the pico, you get more expiratory neurons, but there's no way it's only expiratory neurons. There's an overlap between inspiratory and expiratory neurons. So that the, these CPGs kind of are not um, restricted to only these little spots here. And uh, what he did next was, and I have to say he did because uh, I, it's way beyond my understanding of math, but he basically uh, did a principal component analysis of, of the neural activity that he recorded from the population. 
to see how this activity correlated. And what he finds is if he looks at the principal component one and two is that this network uh, goes and, and, and basically he looked at the, the trajectory of this activity. And you can see that basically during each respiratory cycle, you go into the activation of the expiratory neurons and then you get the activation of the inspiratory neurons you get the activation of expiratory neurons, et cetera. And this is going on in a very circular fashion. And if you change the speed, you don't change the uh, trajectory, but it just goes uh, faster. Now, how can we relate this activity now to the three phase rhythm that I just showed you? And, um, and this is shown in the next slide here. So this is uh, this population activity as it goes into expiration and then inspiration. And then here is where the switch occurs from inspiration to post-inspiration. And what you can see is that in fact, the inspiratory activity and also the formation of the expiratory activity is pretty variable from cycle to cycle. But what is not variable is in fact, this, this switch from one phase to the other. So you have here like an attractor state where this network goes in and then starts forming the next cycle and next cycle, et cetera. So this Mino, is, yes. Can I ask you a question? Oh, please, Jorge. Why, why are you calling this expiratory when I thought this was post-inspiratory? Post oh, you know what? Uh, my apologies, but post-inspiration is a form of expiration. And it is only called post-inspiration because it's activated after the inspiration, but it is, it's also what we call sometimes a passive expiration. Yeah, so it yeah. is, it is an expiratory phase. And, um, and this is basically a similar plot. In this case, he, however, <coughs> uh, plotted not the phase, but the, the change of activation. And you can see that during the burst, it, you have the fastest change in activity, which is correlated to this activity here. And then you get this fast burst then you get the trigger. And then what's interesting is this percolation phase, again, is, is a slow phase. So it takes time until you hit the burst. And once you hit the burst, it goes over and gets to the next cycle. So clearly, you know, this concept of small microcircuits is an oversimplification because clearly, you know, these neurons are spreading along the entire column here. And, um, and the reason I think we, we always sold it as a microcircuit, like almost like a locust uh, flight system is that uh, <clears throat> this was all driven by the concept of necessity and sufficiency. Because indeed, uh, the pre bertzinger complex was the area which is the most rhythmogenic one where you can isolate a slice and it's still rhythmically active in phase with inspiration. And the pico area, when you isolate this, you can still generate this expiratory, post-inspiratory activity. <clears throat> so basically, uh, these are uh, CPGs in so far, but when they're embedded, the borders are not as defined as they might appear uh, when, when you talk about these in isolation. And, um, and so we should have known this because when we looked at these DBX1 neurons in a transfer slice, you can see these DBX1 neurons are not only present in the pre -Bertzinger, they actually transfer from ventral to the dorsal part. And in fact, these uh, neurons form an entire column uh, from caudal to the end of the medulla. So the pre complex is only one part of this whole column of DBX1 neurons. And, uh, and Nathan, again, uh, started to ask the question, you know, how distributed is this activity of inspiratory neurons or uh, population activity in the slice? And so he mapped the activity. And what you find is that indeed, uh, most of the activity is concentrated around the pre complex. So basically, uh, indeed, there is an area where most of the inspiratory rhythm is generated. But if you block synaptic inhibition, then this network starts to recruit also neurons more rostral. And so the network starts to expand beyond the pre complex. And as you disinhibit this network, uh, you actually start to change also the refractive period. And in fact, uh, what Nathan also showed is that as you recruit these neurons, they're also capable of bursting. So 
So basically you have a rhythm generator here, but these neurons are also contributing to the generation of the burst. <clears throat> now, uh, this is shown here in another slide. You have population activity before. There's very little rostral to the pre single complex, but then you block inhibition. And now you start to recruit a bunch of neurons and they're also active in phase with inspiration. Now, because now you expanded that network, you also expanded the excitability and you get a much longer refractive period. And as a result, the breathing, the respiratory rhythm goes down as you block inhibition. And uh, you can show this not only in vitro, but also in vivo. So if Nathan injected strychnine and gabazine into the pre Bertzinger complex or in this network in general, uh, your frequency goes down and the amplitude goes up by recruiting other areas. Now this becomes physiologically very important. And it becomes important because each time you take a breath, you actually activate lung afferences. And these lung afferences actually inhibit your breathing and they prevent that you overextend your lungs. And this is a very famous uh, uh, herring Breuer reflex. So if you stimulate the lungs, uh, you inflate them, you inhibit breathing. So that's described, uh, I think, already in the 30s. And, um, and so these lung afferences, in fact, are responsible for the inhibition of these respiratory neurons rostral to the pre complex. And so if you go into an animal and now remove these afferences, what happens is you start to recruit neurons rostrally and the network expands. And as the network expands, you increase again the refractive period and the frequency goes down. And this is basically why you need these lung afferences because if you remove them, your breathing gets so slow that it's physiologically not actually uh, uh, able to survive. You, you, you won't survive this. Now, so basically what these afferences are doing is they reduce your network to a smaller network. They restrict it in fact to this pre area and, uh, and therefore can increase the frequency and, uh, and reduce the refractive period. Now, you have the opposite situation when you expose the network to hypoxia, because we know that during hypoxia, you actually start to inhibit all the inhibiting neurons. So the iPSCs in these neurons shuts down, and now the network expands very much like what we saw when you block out, uh, synaptic inhibition, the Russell part of the network expands and uh, you get a dramatic increase in the amplitude. Now, these are neural pixel recordings from Nick again, you can see here, uh, this is from caudal to rostral. Here is the pre Bertzinger complex. You get these neurons activated in inspiration. And now you go into hypoxia. And now you start to recruit also in vivo all these neurons rostrally. And the network expands and now becomes much slower. And so basically, to summarize this, vagal afferences seem to reduce the network, increase the frequency, and, and uh, allow for normal breathing, which we call eupnea. Whereas if you remove, if you apply hypoxia, uh, synaptic inhibition is reduced and now the network expands and uh, becomes a different state, it will become uh, involved in gasping. And as this transition happens, actually the characteristics of the network change fundamentally. And I showed you the circular uh, characteristics where you go from expiration to inspiration, expiration, inspiration, during eupnic activity. And now you expose this network to hypoxia. And when you do this and speed this up a little bit because I'm a little impatient, you can see the circular uh, formation gets disturbed and it becomes much more ballistic. So now it, it slowly but surely the network goes into the gasping state as synaptic inhibition is reduced. All the neurons that were before active with inspiration and expiration are now synchronizing to generate only inspiration. And then you go into this gasping mode where uh, it's a very different state of the network. Okay. Oh, something is wrong. Ah, oh, yeah, this is just the, the gasping network. Uh, later on, you can see it, it's basically stuck. And then from time to time, you get a burst, took, and, and, um, and this is then promoting inspiration. Okay.
So I showed you basically that rhythmogenesis is highly dynamic. You know, you can expand the network, you recruit neurons, but not only rhythmogenesis is dynamic, but also how neuromodulators affect the network is highly dynamic. And I told you the story about substance P, but I wanna make it a little bit more complicated because we started to look at this also in the whole animal. And, uh, and substance P, as I showed you, is increasing the frequency. And if you look in vitro, you isolate the pre-Bertzinger complex and you block uh, activation of the NK1 receptor by, with this antagonist, you can see that the respiratory frequency goes down, it goes down, but the rhythm becomes also more irregular. And when you look at the standard deviation, it's highly reproducible the, uh, from animal to animal, no problem. You always get a reduction in the frequency, the rhythm becomes irregular. <clears throat> now, when Atsushi Doi started to test this in vivo by injecting the same antagonist in the whole animal, he got again a surprise because when the animal was breathing at two hertz, you see very little effect on the frequency. So at two hertz, uh, basically, the network, uh, the animal couldn't care less about blocking substance P. There was almost no inhibition. However, sometimes he had animals that breathe, were breathing much slower. And if you now, like, like 1.5 to 0.5 hertz, if you now block the substance P, the NK1 receptor, you get a dramatic reduction of up to 50%. So basically the state of the network changed from this highly modulatory state to a weakly modulatory state. And this is due to the interaction between these different neuromodulators. And so you can take a network that is in a high modulatory state, receptor P blockade does nothing. And you can start to block other neuromodulators, like for example, blocking adrenergic receptors, serotonin. And if you now block substance P, the network starts to fall apart. So you're transforming your network from a high metabolic state into a low neuromodulatory state. You can do also this, oh, ba -da, ba -da, ba -da, ba -da. my God, getting again too overexcited. But you can do the same thing by stimulating the locus cerealis. Now here you release neuromodulators and you bring a weakly modulatory state into a high modulatory state where again, substance P does nothing. So basically what these neuromodulators doing, they can stabilize your network in vivo. And this is very relevant, for example, when you're awake, you're in a high metabolic state, you have a lot of norepinephrine in your, in your brain, you have a lot of serotonin in your brain, and your breathing is pretty stable. When you go to sleep, you, your modulatory tone goes down, you have less norepinephrine drive, you have less serotonin drive, and your network goes into this uh, very irregular breathing rhythm. So this suggests that indeed, neuromodulators are important for stabilizing breathing. But now we ask the question whether more is always good or can you actually overexcite this network? Can you have too many neuromodulators there and your network starts to fall apart because it's too excited? And this is again, a recording from Nick Bush. So here's an animal breathing pretty regular at two Hertz. This is the frequency from one cycle to the other. This is one neuron, that's another inspiratory neuron. You can see these neurons are firing here from cycle to cycle in a very regular fashion. You have here a beautiful refractive period during which the onset of expiratory neurons happens. But then he switches from oxygen to normoxia and the animal starts to get breathing much faster. It gets hyper excitable. So you go into four to up to eight Hertz breathing. And you can see that the network starts to become very, very irregular. It's invading your refractive period here. And when you plot uh, the respiratory output, you can see that now in this hyper excitable state, you have a large variability in the amplitude, but also in the frequency. You have slow respiratory, then faster, very different than if the network is uh, at two hertz. So obviously you can bring the network into a hyper excitable state. And, uh, we wanted to know more about this. And this is the project then that was taken on by Nick Borgraf. And uh, Nick looked at this, this um, with in vitro slices. So in 25% of the cases, you can isolate a transverse slice or horizontal slice, sorry, 
<clears throat> at three millimolar potassium, which is actually physiological. And then you get a rhythm like this. And sometimes it's not very stable. And if you raise potassium, you raise the excitability of this network, you can see the network becomes more stable. So it has more regular rhythm, more regular amplitude. But then you hit the maximum. And if you now increase the potassium concentration even more to eight millimolar, then you start to become irregular. The network becomes hyper excitable. It, it has irregularities in the rhythm and also in the amplitude. But every slice was different, okay? So you had some slices. In fact, most of the slices were not active at three millimolar. You gave them five millimolar. They started to become rhythmic, but the network was not fully excited. So you had to raise a little bit potassium and then they become stable. <clears throat> and you had sometimes the opposite. You had a slice that was perfectly rhythmic at three millimolar, but then as you increase potassium concentration, it became more irregular. So when you plot all this, what you find is that the respiratory network has always an optimum of stability. It, this optimum is reached in every slice at a different level, but once you hit this, hit this optimum of stability and you bring it into more excitation, then the network starts to fall apart and becomes irregular. So basically there's an inherent property of this rhythm generating network to have an optimum stability beyond which it becomes irregular. <clears throat> and, uh, and it can become like this. And this turns out to be extremely important for understanding opiate induced respiration, you know? And, uh, and you know, every day hundreds of people die because of an overdose because of opiates. And people don't know, you know, why on one day you're fine with a certain dose, but on another day you die of it. And so Nick actually started to look at this carefully by looking at the effect of these opiate drugs in relation to the stability curve. So if he took an animal that was irregular at five millimolar, a slice, sorry, and raised the potassium concentration so it reached the maximum stability <clears throat> and then applied DAMGO, the opiate, then you can see the slice became very unstable, fell apart, and at 200 nanomol, it actually stopped generating respiratory rhythm altogether. So basically, if you're in this hypometabolic state, then the opiate will totally suppress the respiratory rhythm. However, if you push the network beyond the stability point, so you have a network that is stable, let's say at this concentration of potassium, you increase the potassium concentration until it becomes hyper excitable. It becomes more irregular, but irregular now because it's hyper excitable. And now if you apply opiate, it brings it back to the stability curve and at 200 nanomolar, it's totally insensitive to DAMGO and the rhythm actually becomes more stable. So basically, depending on where it, your network sits, the DAMGO, the opiate, can either shut down the network or it actually can stabilize the network. And this, I think, is extremely relevant uh, because of biological reasons. And here's the reason. So if you're basically attacked by a not so got nice guy or by a wolf, what happens is you start to release all your excitatory neuromodulators. You go into this flight and fight situation. Your network becomes highly unstable. You start to breathe very fast, <sighs> etc. And the only way you will avoid that this wolf, wolf actually attacks you is that you calm yourself. You release your endorphins. You say, hey, you know what? I can handle this. You calm down. The animal will see that your breathing will will become more stable and, and probably you will survive this. And so I think there has been an evolutionary advantage of this system that uh, you know, can stabilize breathing as you become into this agitated state. And endorphins play a big role. And indeed, if you give someone opiates, if they're in a panic attack, like in a dyspnea situation, then opiates actually are very beneficial and they, they uh, calm down your breathing. However, opiates are often used uh, against pain. Uh, and if you now during sleep take opiates, now your whole network is in a hypometabolic state. I told you noadrenaline is reduced, serotonin is reduced, 
And now the same dose actually will shut you down and cause a fatal overdose. And so I think it's very important to consider these neuromodulators always on the state of this individual neural network uh, within the confines of the stability curve. So depending on where your network is, a neuromodulator can have a stabilizing effect or a suppressing effect. And, and in the clinic, of course, this is a matter of life and death. And uh, indeed, when we look at the opala, when we look at the uh, doses that cause uh, fatal overdoses, then you can see there's huge variability. And the killer of this is that, you know, the same dose that is fine on one day can kill you on the other day. And, uh, and in fact, when you look at the statistics uh, during a one hour talk, probably 12 people in the US have died on opiates. So it's a huge problem. So I wanna wrap up now and give you uh, some conclusions here. What I showed you is that every rhythmic cycle is stochastically assembled uh, based on this interaction between excitation, bursting and inhibition. And every cycle is kind of different. You know, even in the locust, you can see this is respiration. Sometimes you have a burst, sometimes you don't. And in the cortical activity, sometimes, uh, you know, this neuron is leading and sometimes the other neuron is leading. So it's, it's stochastically assembled. I also showed that the in vitro pre complex established a three-phase rhythm based on the synaptic interaction between excitation and inhibition and the refractive period. And, but this rhythm that is established in vitro is like a temporal skeleton on which now you have the synaptic interaction between the inspiratory and expiratory neurons that actually generate breathing. And so the actual breathing is dependent on this transition between inspiratory neurons and expiratory neurons where you have the tractor point in this switch from inspiration to expiration or post-inspiration. And uh, what I also showed you that the spatial extent of this network is dynamically regulated by afferent input. For example, vagal afferents has reduced this network. And then uh, during hypoxia and probably driven also by chemoafferences, the network can expand. And as this network expands and contracts, you change the refractive period and you change actually the, the, uh, the rhythmogenic processes. So you're going from a network that is driving inspiration, expiration to a network that is only generating inspiration and is generating this in a very ballistic way for every burst is, is created uh, anew. I also showed you that the respiratory network is highly modulated, highly dynamic. We have numerous interacting neuromodulators and uh, this interaction is very critical and determines actually how a neuromodulator works. So basically neuromodulation depends on the dynamic state of this entire network, which has actually an optimal state of stability. And uh, there, there is such a thing as too much of something. And um, Nick uh, Borgraf, who, who conducted this project conceptually, but also experimentally uh, disagrees on me that there's such a thing as too much beer. And uh, here, I want to thank Nick, who, who did this amazing work uh, on the opiate depression. I also want to thank, you know, Nick Bush, who did all the, um, you know, multi-array recordings, the NeuroPixels. Then uh, I mentioned uh, also the work from Alisa Half here, and uh, who works very closely with Malusa and Luis on, on swallowing in the interaction. And I'm very sorry that I didn't tell you all the beautiful work done by Liza on, on the Psi, the generation of Psi and the neuroglia interaction. I didn't tell you a lot of uh, the work that actually Aguan Wei did because he basically showed very nicely how uh, opiates act on the presynaptic mechanism. And then right now, um, Aguan is working together with Hema to do RNA-seq because, you know, I, we are having the S, uh, DBX1 neurons, we are having inhibition neurons, but they can be further divided based on you know, subtypes uh, genetic wise. And so we're trying to get really to the point where we have individual neurons that we can manipulate. Then there's Jia who is a clinician, Jia Wang from Peru, and she is studying actually sleep apnea in patients. So we wanna bring all this uh, understanding to, to the human. We're working very closely with Frank Kalume, who is studying epilepsy, but also uh, uh, mitochondrial diseases that have huge breathing problems. So then we have some undergraduates uh, like Julia and Skyler who play a big role in, 
also analyzing this data. So this is uh, what I wanted to tell you. And um, thank you so much. And I hope you didn't fall asleep. And I hope um, it was exciting to you. So thanks so much. You know what, can I uh, stop the sharing so I can see you? Okay, cool. Okay. This was a bombardment. I'm sorry about it. <laughs> All right. Arzan has a question. Uh, uh, you should take charge of questions. A lot of people have questions, but yeah. I'm gonna, I have several questions, but I'll ask one. I'll start with the first one, which is, yeah. Why would, uh, by the way, beautiful talk, you know, as usual, I, I, very, very beautiful and inspiring. And I learned a lot. And um, the question, the first question I wanted to ask is why would passive expiration require a CPG? <laughs> you know what, Frasen, that's exactly what people think. You know, they said, why the heck should you have it? Because it's driven by the recall forces. The only problem is you cannot manipulate the recall forces. And uh, basically you have to control it because otherwise you would go like, <gasps> you know, <sighs> it, 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 you would basically release. So you have to control it. And, and therefore, you know, you, you have another oscillator that controls your, your laryngeal muscles and et cetera. And also it has to become independent, you know, because post-inspiration is involved in different behaviors. It's involved in swallowing, in vocalization. So I think it makes kind of teleological sense that you have uh, different oscillators. And it's actually not too different how people think about locomotion, correct? And if you think about the concept of, of Stan Grillner, where he talks about coupled oscillators, and also when you think about the different phases of locomotion. The idea is also that you're coupling kind of like burst generators and swing generators, et cetera, in order to generate this rhythm. So I, I think it's a fundamental principle, but teleological, I think it's actually very critical for survival. I think Ron is very eager to ask a question. Ron. Uh, it was a great, very, very clear talk. You know, um, I learned a lot. Tell us a little bit about what goes on in that percolation phase. That's a phase where there's no inhibition. Uh, what's going on? You know, uh, Jack and I will fight over that. Okay, Jack Feldman and I have total disagreement on that. So Jack Feldman thinks everything is driven here, just excitatory synaptic activity. And, uh, but I think it's a combination of synaptic excitation on intrinsic bursting. And, and I gave you, unfortunately, a very simple version of my talk. And um, because these bursting neurons, they don't fire only at the end of inspiration, but they can also fire in phase during this percolation phase. And thereby, they can start to also cause the phase advance. So I think it's a combination of these bursting properties and excitation that, that plays a role that then triggers the cycle. But I think what's kind of exciting about why I like this, this principal component analysis is that this percolation phase is actually a very, um, let's say variable phase. You know, you, you're, you're fighting between excitation, you're fighting between excitation, inhibition, you're fighting between expiratory neurons and inspiratory neurons. And, and when this battle is, is won, is variable from cycle to cycle. Whereas the off switch, you know, when you have this refractive period, the, the, the activation of PICO, that is like, boom, it's, it's like very sharp. So that's why we think, you know, you have this percolation phase that establishes the, your inspiration, but when it shuts down, it shuts down very abruptly. So I think it's different mechanism for the on switch and the off switch. So and, P just sort of raises the excitation of yes. Inspiration phase. Yeah, and you know what? And 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 I'm very embarrassed to say because, I, you know, I grew up. There was a lot of fights between the in vivo and in vitro people. The in vivo people would always reject the papers from the in vivo people, etc. You know, like it was like it's a battle, and the in vivo people always talked about the off switch mechanism. 
as you know the holy grail of breathing rhythm generation. And I said, bullshit, the off switch mechanism, you know, you, the neurons are doing this themselves because of the refractive period. But now when we look at the in vivo situation, in fact, you know, in a way they're totally right. This off switch mechanism is a huge, huge mechanism for the generation of breathing in vivo. So like always, and I think it's for the young people here, a big lesson is always everybody's right in the end, you know? But we get very agitated and, 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 and fight each other for a long time, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Ron. I love that question. Oh. And, and I have to say, by the way, we're in the middle of this investigation. So, so there's a lot of analysis to be done because uh, you know, Nick did amazing work to, to map exactly you know, where are the glutamatergic neurons, where are the inhibiting neurons. We are now having like getting like these glycinergic neurons. So, so, so we're really starting to dig deeper and then want to combine this also with the RNA-seq to know and, and uh, you know, uh, where, you know, because inhibitory neurons is not just inhibitory neurons, there are different types. And, and so we have to dig deeper and, and we're just starting to do that. Thank God I'm still young and, and, and you know, have time. <clears throat> oh. So Nino, yes, beautiful um, mm -hmm. talk. What about what about vocalizations? You would think that this is gonna this is where vocalizations come from, and the vocalizations are not just in mammals; they're all across vertebrates using this system, frogs, birds, the whole thing. You know, I I got uh, okay. Look, it I take things off sometimes personal. Thank God I have a wife that tells me don't take things personal. But but we we put. In, an, in our paper where we described Pico said, well, Pico probably is not just pose inspiration, also probably controls vocalization. Now there are several papers coming out now where they show that in fact, exactly that area is critical for vocalization. They show this in mice, but they don't call it Pico. They call it whatever other, other names. So, so uh, but I think they show that in fact, this area is critical for vocalization, but of course, the situation is a little bit more complicated because you have the Pico area, which sits eventually and overlaps with post-inspiration circuit. But then you have a whole network that sits uh, uh, more dorsal in, in the area of the NTS. That's where all the afferences come in. And, uh, and we have always ignored this. We in vitro people always ignored that area. But now we have to understand, you know, it, it's the same thing for swallowing. It's highly sensory controlled and, and, and basically vocalization, swallowing, all this probably uh, um, in, is an interaction not only with PICO, but also oscillators that are sitting dorsally. So, so whatever I told you today, you know, is, is probably, I wouldn't say wrong, but it's, it's oversimplified. It's probably interactions with the cells that Darcy Kelly has been studying with the Xenopus yes, oscillations yes. and Andy Bass with the- with Oh my the God. Yeah, Andy Bass's work is, is my uh, all-time hero. And, and he kind of showed, you know, that you have these oscillators in the ventral part of the medulla that are, and there's like an interesting fish uh, where the pre complex actually becomes interesting in vocalization, you know? So yeah, absolutely. There's overlap, but you know, different species might use it in different ways. Absolutely. You know, and, and, and so they, they will recruit these networks for, for different things. Great. Great job. That's good. Yeah, thanks. I reckon the um, it was a great talk. Thanks a lot, Nino. One question. You showed that essentially um, efferent input controls sort of spatial, um, sort of the, the spatial covering of the network. And then, then the question for me comes up. And then you said, OK, that changes the rhythm or that, that has influence on the phasing of the rhythm. So what do you, so how can you envision that to, to operate when you, unless you do have sort of neurons which come in at different phases, or do you envision that these neurons simply provide more drive that then has stronger impact on, on the next sort of output stage? Yeah, you know, and this is, uh, Ansgar, this is an, an ongoing bro project right now because we have now these mice where we can activate specific uh, lung mechanoreceptors. Mm -hmm. The idea is, you know, each time you take a breath, then uh, you activate these mechanoreceptors and you have different types of mechanoreceptors that then control uh, 
your extended respiratory network, but with a bias towards the rostral part. Mm -hmm. and, and this comes via the NTS. And, yeah. uh, and this happens in a phasic manner, every cycle, you know, you basically reducing this. So, so that's why I'm thinking that this whole idea of the pre Bretzinger complex as an inspiratory rhythm generator is really a, a, a dynamically generated concept. So basically every time you take a breath, you shrink your network indeed to this pre Bretzinger complex area, but the network in reality is way bigger, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, but again, this is an oversimplification because uh, we have very cool, very preliminary data where, where you know, different afferences will af do different things, you know, like you, you affect laryngeal reflexes. So, so it's like a whole can of worms. Uh, you know, Would it be possible to do a similar experiment than Heglund et al. in 2013 to the pre Bexima in a sense that you have sort of illuminate specific different areas in a, in a neurogenetically tagged prep where you can, where you have that's expression what, of cation channels? That's what we have. Like we have basically different markers mm -hmm. that are uh, uh, for the different types. And in fact, that was the original plan for, for Nick Bush until he got carried away with a neuropixel, but he will go back because Nick has a background in, in whisking and sensory uh, drive of this. So yeah. But we want to look at this, you know, definitely. This is, and, and yes, optogenetic is, is the way to do it, you know, because, you know, in the olden days, we would always ask the question by putting drugs in, you know, like blocking whatever neurotransmitter. And, but then you lose the temporal component. Mm -hmm. And as I showed you today, it's like the temporal component is the key to understand it. And, and that's why optogenetics is so cool, you know, and, and, and we have to revisit all this. Thanks. Ron, super, super talk. It's really, uh, as Ron, well, thank you. It's really, really incredible. Um, it was really interesting looking at the, at the slow increase in firing of the inspiratory neurons before the burst. It kind of looks like a wind-up phenomenon. Yes, and yes. motor neurons, Frederic Brocard in France has been studying this and has shown that the wind-up is actually due to the very, very, very slow closing of a voltage-dependent potassium channel. And um, it's activated during the burst and shuts the cell down, and, but it has time constants on the order of several seconds for activation and deactivation. I wonder whether these extraordinarily <laughs> slow currents might play a role. Ron, Ron, yes. Uh, you know, last night at, at midnight, I realized my talk is like four hours long. And, and so I cut a lot of things and, uh, and one, of the slides I cut is basically where you see these intrinsically bursting neurons that are really slowly ramping up. So they don't need any synaptic drive to have this ramp. And then I think uh, here comes also Gennady. And, and I, I know Gennady will ask me that. Uh, this probably will activate your, your sodium pump that then probably plays a big role in the shutdown of, of this network. And, uh, and Gennady is, is, is is preaching to me all the time that, you know, we have to look at this. And I, I think he's totally right. You know, like this dramatic shutdown that you see in all the systems, you know, probably also happens here. So I, I agree, uh, Ron, there is this slow current, that intrinsic current. And, and as I said, my apologies that I simplified my talk here, but uh, yeah, that's the reality. I have another really quick comment. Um, the effects that you saw on the effects of opiates as a function of frequency and, and, and optimal frequency is really, really fascinating. There's a phenomenon known as conditional tolerance or behavioral tolerance, which has been studied from mice to rats to humans, where if an animal uh, is exposed to opiates in a familiar location where there are lots of cues predicting the arrival of opiates, um, they activate a rapid tolerance mechanism that can be activated within seconds or certainly less than a minute. Um, and if, if they, are, they take the drug in a room or a, a place, this goes again from rats to humans, where they are not exposed to those cues, they do not activate these conditional mechanisms. One of them is an increase in, in, in respiratory rate, others increasing yeah. in, in blood pressure, both of which are, are depressed by, um, by opiates. And several people have argued that many, many of the deaths due to 
opiates are due to people taking the same amount of drug in a new location where these mechanisms, for example, enhancement and respiration do not take place. The compensatory mechanism is not there and therefore uh, they have a much stronger response and end up dead. So yeah, it's really, a, your, your research is a fantastic insight on that point. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and, you know, people don't think in, in, in network states when they think about neuromodulation and, and that actually explains everything. And, uh, and, and of course, it totally makes sense now, but, but people, I mean, like, we actually had a hard time to publish this even because people said, yeah, so it's trivial, of course, opiates depress breathing, but A, it's the state that is critical. And, uh, and uh, Nathan Birch, who is now his own faculty, is looking actually at the effect of these OPRM neurons. So we, we can stimulate these, these uh, or he can now, uh, stimulate these opiate releasing neurons to to look at the behavioral context of this. So so absolutely, this is very very important to understand now. Yeah. I actually have a question about this. Nice talk, Dino. Thanks, um, so uh, what I don't get is if there's anything special about opiates here. I mean, I understand the whole behavioral thing in in in, in people and all kinds of things play a role. But you do this at the network level, and you find that you know, there's a narrow range uh, past which the, the network behaves unstably. And I'm, what I don't get is if, if, you, if that's true for other modulators too, I mean, what's special about opioids is if you do the same experiment and went through different doses of, of amines or other, other neuropeptides, would you see the same thing? Or is there something particular about about opioid modulation. No. no, you're absolutely right. You know, and the, the reason you focus on opiates is because it's so clinically relevant. And, and, but it is basically the opiates acting on, you know, the synaptic mechanism and, and, the, and, and also the intrinsic mechanisms. Uh, what's interesting about this is that there are differential effects. You know, like you have a postsynaptic effect where you hyperporize these neurons. And then you have a, a, um, a phasic where you go presynaptically and shut down the network. And then on top of this, and that's ongoing work by Nick Borgraf, in fact, the tonic neurons play a huge role. I, I have not even talked about these tonic neurons yet at all, but they set the excitability level of this network and they're actually affected by opiates. And here comes the IH current. You know, the IH current seems to protect you against the hypo excitable state. And then you have a potassium channel, the case in Q5 that protects you against the hyper excitable state via these tonic neurons that, that keep your network in the stable zone. So for us, the opiates are incredibly good tools to dissect how these neuromodulators as an inhibitory modulator affect it. And I showed you, we not only look at, at opiates as inhibitory, but also at substance P is an excitatory. So they, you know, this network has, has these players that work together in order to keep that network stable. So yeah, I don't want to say that opiate is, is something. So matostatin is also an inhibitor net, uh, modulator and they all converge and do different things. And, and it takes four years to unravel exactly how they do it. But, or, but have you done it? I mean, it's like yeah. an SCG coming up with a, you know, with a combination of, not in a completely crazy modulatory application that actually crashes the rhythm is almost impossible, right? Oh yeah, no, no, but here you can. I mean, this is the, the Atsushi paper, you know, like Atsushi Doi, where he basically um, blocked, you know, norepinephrine, serotonin, and also NK1, and the network really crashes. And, um, and so, and if you then put on opiates, then of course it's gone. So, so the network can crash very easily. Uh, Nick is now doing like experiments where he blocks the IH current, the network crashes very quickly, you know, because you don't have this protection. And so, yeah. I was kind so of hoping that my respiratory system is the most robust CPG around, but apparently- uh, that's No, but that's, that's why you're wearing this freaking mask, you know, it, it, it's, not, <laughs> it's not always the case, you know, it's, a, it's amazing that we survive all the time. Razan. Sorry, I think um, one of my questions you kind of alluded to, and I was 
wanted to play Gennady and say, is the sodium potassium pump contributing to the refractory period? Because it looks like you have more excitability. So is it? I, I am 100%. Look, I mean. Yeah, you uh, haven't, wait, you wait, haven't wait, wait, carefully. Farsan, Farsan, we haven't done the experiment carefully. Yeah, but, that's fine. But no, my so so let me go. Absolutely. And, and the only reason I haven't done it is like, like, I'm swamped with stuff, with too many. No, stuff. no, that's fine. Yeah, that's that's good. Hey, what, what's um, it? Let me I ask you. A... That Ricardo of Gennady's lab is joining my lab, and oh, great. we will do okay. exactly that. Good, good. Yeah. So let me ask you another obnoxious question. Um, yeah. So, why would it be necessary to stabilize the breathing while you're awake? rather than while you're asleep you're, or any other time. Because while you're awake, especially with vocalization and swallowing and whatnot, you want to have more flexibility, right? While you're sleeping, you just want to breathe in and breathe out, you know, and you don't want to die. Mm -hmm. So what, how does that make sense? You know, Farsan, I think that the, the breathing is actually in a meta-stable state. You know, it is not really stable. And, and you know, like, for example, when you're you're jogging okay so you're you're running 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 now now your breathing becomes like very stable and now if you want to talk now it's actually a problem you know because you cannot talk or if a if a little kid comes to you and is totally excited you know then then basically you cannot do this so i think your network is continuously in this in this hyper stable state in order to allow you to control with the cortex your breathing you know and it there's a fascinating control i mean like if if i want to say a long sentence i take a bigger breath than if i say a short sentence and that the, the duration of the sentence depends on the on on the grammar and all sorts of things and our brain can do this because the breathing is not stable like a machine you know yeah but it becomes a problem during sleep, you know, in sleep, you know, that's, uh, you know, because it becomes unstable because all your neuromodulators are down and you, you know, like if, if you're in, in REM sleep or in non-REM, you know, like the breathing is very irregular, you know. Thank you. Thanks. All right. I'm sure there are many more questions, but it's pretty late and we're losing our audience. So 